This week I uh, received an email. It was pictures of schools all around the world. And it's probably no surprise to many of you, certainly us that work in education, that the news doesn't necessarily speak highly of us most of the time. They're always faulting us for this, faulting us for that, how bad our schools are. So I sent these pictures out to my staff and said, you know, we really truly do need to be thankful for the school that we work in, the school system that we have here in this country. And looking at these pictures, it was just amazing some of the places that students around the world go to school. Most of them were dirt floors. They may or may not have had desks. Um, they were sharing books, sharing pencils. Just the materials and the blessings that we have here in this country is just so much greater than what we see around the world. Um, one of these years I am hoping when we go to Jamaica or the Bahamas to take a look at their schools there because it is, it's very different. Um, the thing that I noticed in all of the pictures though, even though these students had nothing, they all had smiles on their faces. So they were truly thankful, at least by appearance, for, for what they had. And certainly by American standards, what they had was basically nothing. Um, the one school was actually out in the middle of a park. They didn't even have a school building. So on rainy days, they had to cancel school in this particular area because they didn't have any place to go. They're out in the middle of a park. So Mr. Bell said, you know, what are we thankful for? And obviously we have a lot to be thankful for in this country. Um, he went through a lot of the list that, that I would have listed as far as things that we need to be thankful for here in this country. Um, but again, it, we are blessed to, to live in this country and to have the things that we have. So the title of my sermon is, To Whom Do We Owe Thanks? Mr. Bell kind of primed the pump, so to speak. You already know the answer to this question. To whom do we owe thanks? Mr. Bell talked a little bit about, about the pilgrims. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, than Mr. Bell did. 1621. In 1621, the pilgrims celebrated what was considered their first Thanksgiving. And we know that they, they celebrated this the year following their landing at Plymouth, which was in 19, or 1960, 1620, 1620. And yeah, they were here a lot longer ago. The, the colony's governor was named William Bradford. And he issued a Thanksgiving proclamation. And for three days, three days, the pilgrims feasted with their Indian guests. Now, I know kind of what my family's in for on Thanksgiving, and I can't imagine eating like that for three full days. There's just no way. You'd have to roll me out of the kitchen, out of the living room. The pilgrims had a little bit different uh, menu than, than maybe what we are used to. Uh, they say that one, on their menu was duck, geese, some swan maybe. They definitely ate some venison. Uh, they ate some fish. Lobster, mussels, eel, and clams. Here the pilgrims probably were not aware of 11, Leviticus 11.3 11, and Deuteronomy 14.16 where it talks about clean and unclean meats. Although there was a good chance that they probably did read through that because they were students of the Bible. However, obviously they didn't understand at that point what that meant if they were eating things like lobster and mussel and eel and that type of thing. Some of the other things that they would have eaten would have been pumpkins. Obviously, the squash and corn, we know that. Cabbage, they would have had red and white grapes, perhaps. Maybe some red and black plums, berries, and some dried fruits. So they had a lot of the same things that, that we would have eaten, but for three days, that's what they feasted on. And again, that was a proclamation that was, was given by William Bradford, which was the governor of that first colony. And again, he, he put forth that proclamation because he was thankful and realized the blessings that, that his colony had been given. So this Thursday, we will do the same. We will give thanks to God. The days of Thanksgiving were celebrated sporadically throughout our nation's history. Um, president George Washington was probably the first president that proclaimed a nationwide day of Thanksgiving. And he did that on November 26th of 1789. Just as William Bradford understood that we were giving thanks for the blessings that God had given to us, George Washington knew the same thing. He made it clear that the day should be dedicated to prayer and to giving thanks to God. So the question again is, to whom do we owe our thanks? President George Washington at the time knew that our thanks did belong to God. 
Moving forward in history just a little bit, there was a lady by the name of Sarah Hale. I don't know how many people are familiar with Sarah Hale. I wasn't until I read this article. She was a 70-year-old woman at the time when she, she wrote this letter. She was an editor of a magazine, and she wrote a letter to President Lincoln. And this occurred in September of 1863, she wrote this letter. And the letter was a letter urging him to have the day of our annual Thanksgiving made a national and a fixed holiday. She explained that you may have observed for that you may have observed for some years past there has been an increasing interest felt in our land, an increasing interest to have Thanksgiving held on the same day in all of the states, not just some of the states. It now needs national recognition and authoritative fixation only to become permanently an American custom and institution. So that was a letter that she had written to Abraham Lincoln. Um, she had written letters to others in the past without responses, according to the history books. Um, I don't know how much you know about Abraham Lincoln, but he definitely was a people's president, and he did try to get back to people. And he did acknowledge Miss Hale. Prior to this particular letter, we didn't have a set day for Thanksgiving in our country. Although it was meant to be in November, it was different times in November. It would have been different weeks. President Lincoln did respond. Um, he actually responded immediately, according to Miss Hale, and she was a little bit surprised because in the past she had not had any response from any of the people that she had written to. So in 1863, in the midst of what we know as the bloody Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln gave a proclamation dedicating the last Thursday in November as a national holiday of Thanksgiving. So we knew that the pilgrims celebrated it. George Washington kind of called for a day of Thanksgiving. And now Abraham Lincoln actually established that Thanksgiving for the whole nation. So again, brethren, what are we to be thankful for? And to whom do we owe our thanks? If you turn to Genesis 49, we'll begin in the Bible in Genesis 49, verse 25. Genesis 49, verse 25. It says, By the God of your Father, who will help you? The Almighty, who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above? Blessings of the deep that crouches beneath blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents, up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. Brethren, we see here that God is the one that provides blessings to each of us. And therefore, it is God that we owe our thanks to. In Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28 in verse 8, talks a little bit more about blessings coming from God. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 8, it says, The Lord will command the blessings on you in the barns and in all that you undertake, and he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Brethren, here we read again that the blessings come from God. The blessings come from God. Is it not God that we then owe our thanks to? If we take a look at the proclamation that Abraham Lincoln gave in 1863, we can see that our 16th president, he understood the need and the purpose of a day of thanksgiving. He knew that we are to be thankful for the blessings that God had bestowed upon us. So what I'd like to do is just read some of that proclamation that Abraham Lincoln actually issued in 1863. Here he writes, he said, The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget, we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added which are so extraordinary in nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the hearts which have habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. Definitely a different style of writing in Abraham Lincoln's time than, than what we read today, 
But it was pretty clear that President Lincoln believed that God's blessings were so great that even those with a hard heart would have to give thanks because they would see the gracious gifts that God had given to them. He also understood that when we have so much, that it is easy to lose sight of the blessings and fail to thank God for what he has provided with us or for us. Can we fall into that same trap today? Do we sometimes demonstrate maybe a more thankful heart when times are tough or directly after a trial? Are we more thankful to God when, when that occurs? Or like Mr. Bell said, are we thankful every day? Yes, this coming Thursday is a day of thanksgiving for the nation. We are not to be part of the nation. We live in it, but we are not part of it. Therefore, do we have a responsibility then to be thankful every day and to give thanks to God every day? We have been blessed. It is easy to forget when things are going well. It's when things get tough that some of us will turn back to God. Continuing on in the proclamation, it says, In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all the nations. Order has been maintained. The laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of the military conflict. He says, while the theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union, needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense. They have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements, and the mines as well, as, as well of iron and coal as the precious metals have yielded even more abundantly than before. So what President Lincoln was saying here, even though the battlefield was devastating, it was horrible, the rest of the nation was blessed. They were blessed with the bounty of, of good harvest. They were blessed with the bounty of peace. Why? Lincoln knew why. There was only one reason. God allowed for that to happen. Horrible battles going on in the rest of the country, but where the battle was not going on, it was a relatively peaceful time in the country. That was certainly a sorrowful time in our history, but as far as peace, there was peace with the exception of the battlefield, according to Lincoln. I'm not sure that we would see that same behavior today if we had a civil war going on. Just think about the news after something like a natural disaster, Katrina. Did we have peace after that natural disaster in New Orleans? It was chaos. There were riots in the street. People burning down their own neighborhoods killing each other. National Guard had to come in to, re to restore the peace. That wasn't even a civil war, that was just a hurricane. Times are different today than they were back then. Again, looting and lawness, lawlessness abounds. We see the same type of behavior when the court system renders a verdict that isn't popular in a particular community. Typically when we're, we're talking about differences in race, especially if it involves a police officer. Some of the communities don't like those judgments. What do they do? Again, they destroy their own community. Peace is not there. Lincoln continued. He said, population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp. Here Lincoln's talking about population has increased, even though many were being killed on the battlefield. It says, in the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to accept continuance of years with large increase in freedom. No human counsel has divided nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. Brethren, Lincoln was a student of the Bible. You look through the, the history books and it talks all about where he got his first Bible, who gave him his first Bible, where he read the Bible, he really was a student. Again, not having the exact same understanding that, that we have, but he did have a pretty wealth of knowledge of the Bible. Lincoln was a student of the Bible, and it appears that that last verse that I read, they are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. 
Turn to Isaiah 30, verse 18. Isaiah 30, verse 18. It appears that President Lincoln clearly understood this verse of Scripture when he wrote that. In Isaiah 30, 18, it says, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all of those who wait for him. President, President Lincoln said this in a, in a speech that he had made. He said, in regard to this great book, he's referring to the Bible, in regard to this great book, I have but to say, it is the best gift that God has ever given to man. Do we give thanks when we pick up that Bible? I can't remember the time, last time I did. I, sometimes you pick it up and you read it. I don't know that, actually, if I've ever given thanks for the Bible. Is that something that maybe we should do? Do we say to God, you know, thank you for giving me your word. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to live in a country where I can read it in public and not be killed. <coughs> Time may be coming when that's not the case. President Lincoln knew that. He said, it's the best gift that God has ever given to man. He continued on to say, all the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it, we but for it could not know right from wrong. If we didn't have this book, we would not know right from wrong. All things most desirable for man's welfare here and hereafter are to be found portrayed in this book. Another scholar wrote this about Lincoln. He said, there was one book which left its mark on much of what he wrote. And again, we can see this in the speeches that he wrote and some of the, the letters that he wrote as well. He said, that was the Bible upon a familiar familiarity, can't say that word, you shouldn't put those words in your sermons you can't say, which extended back to his youth, he could also depend. He says, for all his mockery, Lincoln was consumed by religion as a subject as well as by the Bible, a book that all biographers agree he read constantly. So again, going back that he was a student of the Bible. If we look back at his proclamation, kind of picking it up somewhere in the middle, it says, he has, seemed to, he has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are set at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving. He didn't stop there. A day of thanksgiving and praise to our Father who dwells in heaven. So not only did he call for a day of thanksgiving, he was very specific who we owe our thanks to. He said the thanks belongs to God the Father. He continued on to say, and I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him, him in capital letters meaning God, for such singular deliverance and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perseverance and disobedience commend to him tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable, lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged. And fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purpose to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and the union. So here President Lincoln talks about, you know, we're in the middle of a civil war. He understands that it's a horrible thing. And that it's going to take God's hand, number one, to end it, but also, also to give forgiveness for what has happened. He understands that peace is given by God, the divine purpose to fulfill the enjoyment of peace, he said. As I said, President Lincoln was a man of the Bible. He did believe differently than we do today. He's, his eyes were not opened as our eyes are open today. He read the scriptures. Plenty of the scriptures he had, he had a true meaning of, but many he, he didn't understand fully. But he truly did understand much of what was in the Bible. President Lincoln made it very clear in his proclamation that our thanks do belong to God. 
just as a recap of some of the words that he used in that semi-lengthy proclamation, he used the word blessings. He used the word gracious gifts of the Most High God, Almighty God, gratefully acknowledged deliverance and blessings, a day of thanksgiving and praise to our Father who dwells in heaven. Lincoln had a clear understanding of who we owe our thanks to. We know that our thanks belongs to God. Now later in 1941, Congress actually adopted a resolution setting Thanksgiving as the fourth Thursday of November, and we've kept it on that same day ever since that, that Congress resolution. If we continued as a country, and Mr. Bell touched on this a little bit in his sermonette, if we continued to follow what President Lincoln proclaimed back in 1863, does our society still believe that our blessings come from God? Do we believe that as a country? Certainly we do. I'm not sure the whole nation does. This coming Thursday, we will keep the national holiday of Thanksgiving. President Washington, President Lincoln both recognized that our blessings that we received are gifts from our Father. They believe that. Do we still believe it today? Will the majority of our country celebrate the national holiday of Thanksgiving as it was celebrated in our nation's history by the pilgrims with that true spirit of Thanksgiving? Times are a lot easier in some respects today than it was for the pilgrims. We're not out looking for deer for our Thanksgiving dinner, trying to chat, trap geese, digging up the fields for the corn. Most of us don't do that. We go to the grocery store. It's a lot easier for us. But sometimes when it's easy, we do forget to give thanks. Now, although some will recognize that our day of Thanksgiving is meant to recognize and give thanks to God for all that he's provided for us, some, what are they going to do? They're going to get together with family. They're going to eat probably a lot, more than many people in this country will ever, or other countries will ever eat. We'll eat more in one day than many will eat in an entire week. Are we thankful for that? Are we thankful for that? After the eating, the guys will go in and watch football. Right? That's what we do. Not that there's anything wrong with that. The ladies usually clean up, although I do help a little bit. The boys will help this year. So we'll eat. We'll go watch football. You'll clean up. After the belly settles a little bit from all the tryptophan from the three pounds of turkey that you ate, you may have taken a nap to kind of sleep off that, that tiredness that the turkey causes. Then you'll come back out again for the pumpkin pie and the apple pie and the ice cream and all the other mounds of food and desserts that we'll have. For many, that's what Thanksgiving is. It's food and family. Again, nothing wrong with that. But are we missing the most important part of that Thanksgiving day? Many have forgotten the roots from which we were founded. Many have not remembered the story of the pilgrims and the Christian roots of our Thanksgiving holiday. It truly is rooted in the Bible, giving thanks. Many of us have forgotten that. There was an article written in May of 2015. It was called America's Changing Religious Landscape. It's kind of an interesting article. It's kind of full of a lot of statistics, which we know statistics, statistics we can use really to prove anything you want. Um, but I think these statistics, although the percentages, we might be able to argue the percentages, the general idea of the article, I think we would agree upon. Again, the, the article's title is America's Changing Religious Landscape. And what it talks about is the decline in the overall belief in God in our country. Now, I would guess that if we were to do this worldwide, it might be similar worldwide, but this, this particular one talks about our country. It says here that the Christian share of the U.S. population, the Christian share, the Christian religion, of the U.S. population is declining. While the number of U.S. adults who do not identify with any organized religion is growing, according to an extensive survey by the Pew Research Center. It says, moreover, these changes are taking place across the religious landscape, affecting all religions of the country in many different demographic groups. While the drop in the Christian affiliation is particularly pronounced among young adults, the future of our country, it is occurring among, among Americans of all ages. 
The same trends are seen among whites, blacks, Latinos, among both college graduates and adults with only a high school education, among women and men as well. So this is rampant across the entire landscape of our country. It says the major new survey, they surveyed roughly 35,000 Americans, and again, across all these different gender gaps and different races and nationalities and the whole gamut of our country, the center finds that the percentage of adults ages 18 and older who describe themselves as Christians has dropped by nearly eight percentage points in just seven years. The percentage seven years ago was 78% said that they would have Christian roots. Now, it's 70%. There's some decimals in there, but just to make it easy, 78% down to 70% in seven years. Over the same period, the percentage of Americans who are religiously unaffiliated, describing themselves as atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, and that's in quotes, nothing in particular, has jumped more than six points, from 16% up to 20, almost 23%. So the people that are proclaiming to be Christian, that number is going down. The people proclaiming to be atheist, agnostic, or, uh, you know, I am what I am type of thing, that number is going up. Changing landscape of the American religious country. It continues on to talk about a lot of other particular groups. This one in particular says growth has especially been great among Muslims and Hindus. We see that in the news. A lot of the refugees come and would not proclaim themselves as Christian. Again, is this leading to a decline in the Christian morality in our country? The lack of thanksgiving. You get away from your roots, you start to forget why we are thankful. One of the most important factors in the declining share of Christians and the growth are what they call the nuns in this generational replacement. The nuns are those that, not the nuns with the Catholic Church, but... N-O-N-E-S, nuns meaning that they have no religion. They don't proclaim to be religious at all. Generational replacement. It says as the millennial generation, which is a younger group of adults, they display much lower levels of religious affiliation, including less connection to Christian churches than the older generation. So as the older generation starts to die off, what should happen is the younger generation replaces them with their Christian beliefs. We are not seeing that. We are seeing a decline in that. This fact alone is alarming. What this means is we move from generation to generation, from here on out, we're probably going to see things get a little bit worse. And we know that's going to be the case because we know what's going to occur towards the end time. This article must be music to Satan's ears. It's exactly what he wants. He's getting exactly what he wants. The older people, when they die, they're not being replaced with more Christians. Makes his work easier. When we're not there preaching the gospel, Satan's work is so much easier. We have fallen pretty far from our Christian roots, our pilgrim roots in that desire for thanksgiving. See, the idea that we owe thanks to God has been completely removed from many American households. Many families will still get together and share that meal. Meal. How many will ask God's blessing beforehand? How many will ask that blessing beforehand? I can tell you at my own house, not my house, but my parents' house that I grew up in, it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago that they asked the blessing before the meal. And they asked me to do it. Before that, I, even growing up in my grandparents' house, I don't ever remember asking a blessing upon a meal. I never remember that. It may have happened here or there, but I don't really have any recollection of it. And I can't imagine that my whole household was all that different than many others. It was a Catholic household, so we were, we were forced to go to church. I wasn't interested in it, but mom told you go to church, go to church. Now it's different. Probably I wasn't so interested because it didn't make any sense. A lot of what they would say in the Bible you would see, they talked and behaved totally differently. Not that it was horrible behavior, but it was different. It didn't match up with what we were reading in the Bible. So how many will ask that blessing? How many will thank God for the blessing of their family that they even have a meal to share with? I can tell you a lot of my students will not share a meal on Thanksgiving. They don't have anybody to share it with. 
The money that they could have purchased a turkey with is going to drugs, alcohol, and tobacco, and everything else. So every year, we're actually one of the Catholic churches in the area, they, they have a meal on Wednesday, all the leftovers they give to us, and then we distribute that out to families that we know is not going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. So how many people think, if you have that family and the means to, to share that meal, how many will thank God for that? I don't know. How many will thank God for the other blessings that they have? It's not just the meal. How about the home to, to, to meet in? Your home probably has heat. The TV will be on with the football game afterwards. All of those things, the PlayStations for the kids, maybe the games that you might play with your family, all of those things are blessings from God. Do we remember that on Thanksgiving, or is it a day to eat? Now, I don't have actual statistics on this. It's probably out there someplace, but I couldn't find it. How many people are going to ask that blessing before Thanksgiving dinner? To me, that would be interesting to, to know what percentage of the population would do that. Like I said, I don't have anything concrete, but if we know that less than 70% of the people proclaim to be Christian, we know the percentage of people that are having Thanksgiving asking the blessing are going to be probably much less than that 70%. Certainly the ones that don't proclaim to be Christian, they're not going to ask a blessing. My family was Christian, and we didn't ask a blessing. So I bet you there's going to be quite a few families that are going to eat that turkey, and God never got his due thanks. Something to think about. The American Thanksgiving has become a day off from work. It's a day to get together with family and stuff our faces with food. For many, that's what it has become. We have lost our way and our roots from the pilgrims. Like I said, when we're done eating, we're going to retire to the living room. I'll probably doze off real quick. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All the kids running around, sometimes it's tough. But, you know, if you eat enough turkey, you can sleep through anything. This, this Thursday, we will celebrate that Thanksgiving. Not many in our country will be truly thankful for what they've been blessed with. Not many will really understand it either. I don't know how much as a country we even explain what the day of Thanksgiving is. Schools don't teach it much. They teach about the pilgrims. They teach about the Indians. Is that Thanksgiving? They were there, but I'm not sure that is, that is the meaning of Thanksgiving. The pilgrims had a really strong belief in God. They valued the teaching of the Bible. You might even say that they were true students of the Bible. We know that they read the Old Testament and the New Testament. They understood that their blessings were not a result of what they have done. You can read that as you just kind of study the history of the pilgrims. They knew that their blessings were not a result of what they, were, what they have done. They knew that they were gracious gifts from God. The pilgrims understood the need to give thanks for all that God had given to them. And again, do we still do that today? We do, yes. How would the majority of this world answer the question regarding thankfulness? <clears throat> thankfulness. Remember, there's a difference between being thankful, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later, and truly giving thanks. One is passive. Being thankful is a passive thing. Giving thanks, that's an active thing. You actually have to do something when you give thanks. Many families will gather this Thursday for an amazing feast. Kings of old would desire some of the things that we're going to be eating. I know Jackson and Mason, I guess they are uh, been commissioned by Papa to smoke the turkey and, and cook the meat, and so they're going to be taking part of that this year. Jackson's been doing it for the last couple of years. The one sleeping here, Mason, he, he just soon sleep in and get up and work, but... This year, Papa says he's going to help with the turkey. So they'll be helping with Thanksgiving dinner. Putting in some of that effort in the work, I think, makes us more thankful, too. If you just passively partake of that day, it's easy to forget what it's all about. But if you actually take part in what it is Thanksgiving is all about, I think it's easier for us to be thankful. Many families will prepare that meal. They'll ring the bell. We'll flock to the table for food, and we will eat without even thinking about it. Not us again, the world. But to whom do we owe our thanks? We sing a song, one of my favorite songs, To All Things Now Living. I won't sing it to you because you don't want to hear that, but we know the words. 
to all things now living, a song of thanksgiving, right? The words say, to all things now living, a song of thanksgiving. To who? To God the Creator, triumphantly rise. So will we triumphantly raise a song and give thanks to God on Thanksgiving? Now, we may not sing our thanks, but will we give thanks? Of course we will. We know that that's what we're required to do. Nehemiah 12, verse 46. Nehemiah 12 and verse 46. It says, For long ago in the days of David, there were directors of singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. Here it's very clear that our thanks belongs to God. We are to sing our praises and thanks to God. So when we do our song service, we don't just sing to fill up time. We know that God enjoys our music. Whether we have a good voice or not, doesn't matter. Lori and Bryant, and Bryant was kind of joking that him and Lori are going to sing special music if the boys will play their guitar. We assured them that Miss Marilyn will have them ready. She'll do her part. The question is, are they going to do theirs to play special music? And we were kind of joking back and forth about, you know, we don't sing very well, but is that the purpose? Does God care how well we sing? Probably not. The point is that we're singing. We're giving thanks to God through song. Now, if it sounds nicer, it's pleasing to us more if, if it sounds nice, but I'm not sure it matters to God. It's the thought that counts to God. So many will thank the host for the meal, for their hospitality, but will they thank God? Some families may go around the table. They may ask each person, what are you thankful for? I know some families have done that. It's a nice activity. But is it an act of thanksgiving? Again, there's a difference between being thankful and giving thanks. Thanksgiving requires active participation. Active participation. Many people are thankful for what they have. As I mentioned before, we live in a country that provides us with pretty much everything we need. Even the poorest among us are extremely rich by national standards in many of the countries that we go to. When we go to Jamaica for the feast, I may have mentioned this before, every night the lifeguards would have this fishing line wrapped around a plastic bottle some makeshift hook on the end of it, and then they would scavenge for some sort of bugs or something to fish with. And we would, I, boy, I, I don't know if Jackson or Mason was with me, but I asked one of the lifeguards, what are you doing? And they'd get these little amber jacks. I mean, they weren't any bigger than this. And they would pull those out, and, you know, we'd kind of ask them, why don't you throw those back? And he looked at us like we were crazy. I probably should have known better. That was their dinner. And boy, were they thankful for that tiny little fish because that was their dinner. These people, they don't have anything compared to our standards. They sell bread by the slice. You don't buy a loaf of bread in Jamaica. You buy a slice of bread because that's what they can afford. So again, we are extremely blessed in this country. We have our computers. We have our nice cars, gaming systems, cell phones, all of those things. We're thankful for those. I know I am. I'm thankful for everything that I have. But do I always take the time to actually give thanks to God. Do I say thank you, God, for the things that you've given me? Not as much as I should. Not as much as I should. If we look through the pages of the Bible for the words thankful and thanksgiving, we will find that the word thanksgiving occurs much more often than the word thankful. Why is that? Well, my take on it is we know that God repeats things that are important. Thanksgiving's important. That's why you're hearing it twice today. Mr. Bell and myself. But God repeats things that are important in the Bible. Not to say the things that he only says once are not important, because we know that's not the case, but emphasis is added when things are repeated over and over. God wants us to understand that the blessings we have received are a gift from him. And again, simply being thankful does not necessarily mean that we give thanks. Mr. Bell used this scripture earlier, James 1.17. Don't need to turn there because you already have it written down. James 1.17, God is the creator and giver of all blessings. God is the creator and giver of all blessings. And then he immediately went into my next scripture. I was getting nervous. I wouldn't have anything to talk about. Luke 17.11, he talked about the ten lepers. Can we relate our... I won't go ahead and read that again, 
um, just because, because it's already been read. But Jesus healed 10, only one gave thanks. Are we sometimes the other nine? Can we sometimes be that other nine that we took our blessing and we moved on? We get that job that we wanted and we cash our paycheck, we buy the things that we want. Did we stop and say, thank you? That's the thanksgiving piece, stopping to say thanks. God knows what he gives us and he knows when we thank him. It was clear here in Luke 17 with the 10 lepers story. Where's the other nine? It's nice of you to come back, but where's the other nine? Did I not heal nine of you or 10 of you? Only one came back. The nine just went about their way. That our country is like the nine. We are like that one, hopefully. All the time, no. Not all the time. Hopefully most of the time we are like that one. Brethren, God does deserve that thankfulness. We need to tell him that we are thankful. The ten men, only one came back. God does emphasize thanksgiving over thankfulness. In looking at the occurrences in the Bible... And there's many, many different words that could be similar to thanksgiving and, and being thankful. But the word thankful is only occurring three times. This was according to an article that Don Hoosier wrote in one of the, the Good News magazines. I don't know which one it was. Not even sure when I came across that. But in it, he kind of outlined the number of times that different words were used. I thought it was interesting. Thankful was used three times. Thanksgiving and similar phrases was used 150 times. Which one's more important? Being thankful or giving thanks? Giving thanks is much better than just being thankful. Giving thanks is good for both parties. Do we feel better when we thank somebody for what they've given us? Somebody gives you something nice, thank you. You give them a hug or a handshake or something. You feel good about that. How about the person that you're thanking? They feel pretty good about it too. So that act of thanksgiving, both parties are pleased with that. If you are thankful, who knows that? You know that. Nobody else around you knows that you're thankful necessarily. But if you give thanks, then people do. God is certainly much more pleased when we say thank you versus us internally just feeling that, that thankfulness. It's important for us to give thanks and to recognize that all we have is a result of God's love for us. He's blessed so many people, yet many do not give the thanks that God deserves. The pilgrims recognized that their very survival in the new world was because of God's intervention and blessings. Numbers 14, verse 9. Numbers 14, verse 9. We'll talk just a little bit about the history of the pilgrims here for the next couple of minutes. We'll kind of set the stage with Numbers 14, verse 9. It says, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protections are removed from the men, from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So if we'd look back at the history of the pilgrims prior to them arriving in Plymouth, we can see that God's hand was at work. Now, it's not recorded anywhere in the Bible that God specifically protected the pilgrims. You can't read that any place. But if we look at the events that occurred in their history, it makes you stop and say, hmm, that was a song, I think. It just makes you stop and say, is there something going on here? Is it bigger than what it appears? Most of us know that the pilgrims left England because of religious persecution. They weren't able to worship in the way that they felt that they needed to. They left England and they went to Holland where they could worship God according to their beliefs without any religious persecution. After a period of time had passed, the pilgrims became concerned, not with their ability to worship, but maybe the lack of worship of those in Holland. The Dutch life was different than, than what they were pleased with and they started seeing things that they weren't happy with. They saw that some of the Dutch behavior was starting to corrupt their children. And they said, you know what? It's time to get out of here. Kind of like you're sitting watching a TV show with your kids and things come up there and, nah, this isn't good. We're going to turn this off and watch something else. 
So the pilgrims had the same thing. They were able to go there. They, they were able to, you know, do their religious worship without persecution. But the stuff going around, they, they weren't happy with. So what did they do? They negotiated with a London stock company to finance a ship. We're going to get on our boat and we're going to get out of here. So they left England. They went to Holland. They weren't happy with Holland. Let's get ourselves a ship and we're going to move. So that's what they did. Two months later, they landed in Plymouth Colony. I mentioned earlier that William Bradford was the first governor and that he established that first Thanksgiving. The settlers called their colony Little Israel. And if you look at some of the history books, some of them would compare William Bradford to Moses. See, in Holland and in England, there was some sort of a spiritual captivity there. Just as the Israelites left Egypt, the pilgrims left those two different places. Again, that demonstrates the knowledge that they had of the Bible. Like Washington and Lincoln that I mentioned earlier, Bradford also gave thanks to God. He knew that thanks belonged to God. He too was a student of the Bible. Exodus 3, 7. Exodus 3, chapter 7. Again, this would have been a scripture that Bradford would have read, that he would have known. Exodus 3, verse 7, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the land of Egypt, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. If we drop down to Exodus 5.1, drop down just a little bit to Exodus 5.1, it says, And afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now, we know that Pharaoh wasn't necessarily agreeable to that first request. We know that. He was not cooperative. And it was quite some time before Pharaoh actually let the Israelites leave Egypt. In Exodus chapter 8, you don't need to turn there. I'm not going to review those. But in Exodus chapter 8, it talks about all the plagues that God brought upon Egypt. Because Pharaoh, he wasn't buying it. He wasn't letting them go. You need a little bit more convincing. God provided that with all the plagues that are outlined in Exodus chapter 8. So just as the Israelites left Egypt, the pilgrims were held in a spiritual captivity, both in England, not so much in Holland, but the corruption was in Holland, so they, they decided they were going to leave there too. The pilgrims were not permitted to worship God as they wished. The pilgrims did not worship and obey God as we are taught necessarily. They had some misconceptions, but they did what they knew. They also had a connection to the Jewish faith in Holland. Although there is, like I said, no direct scriptural reference that God directly intervened in the lives of the pilgrims, many believe that he did. I'm going to share just a little bit of, of that story. And as you listen to it, do you think these things could have happened by chance? In my mind, there's way too much coincidence for this to have all worked out the way that it did. So prior to the pilgrims arriving in the New World, most people in school, kids in school, learn about Squanto. We know the word Squanto. We know he was an Indian. Many people knew that Squanto helped the pilgrims, which he did. That's usually where the knowledge ended. It did for me until I came across a couple of these different stories. The interesting thing with Squanto was before the pilgrims met him, he was taken captive. He was taken from the New World. He was taken captive and he was brought to England. There he was taught English so that he could communicate with the explorers. The English wanted an Indian from the New World that spoke English so that he could guide the explorers to the most inhabitable and the most profitable sections of the New World. So here's an Indian in the, in the Americas not called that at the time, but eventually became that, taken captive, brought to England, and taught English. 
Keeping in mind, this is going to be the Indian that's going to help the pilgrims later on. Squanto then returned to the New World on Captain John Smith's ship. Most kids know John Smith and that Squanto was associated with him. And they landed in Plymouth. Later, Squanto's luck was bad again. He got taken captive again. This time not by the English, this time by the Spanish. And he was brought to Spain by a guy by the name of Captain John Hunt. While in Spain, Squanto was rescued and brought into the Christian faith. So the first time that he was captured, taken to England, taught English. Went back, bad luck again, he got caught. Didn't learn how to run the first time apparently. Or God may have had a hand in it, I don't know. Got caught again, he was then taken to Spain where he learned the Christian faith. How many Indians in the New World spoke English and understood the Christian faith? Squanto. And maybe a few after, I don't really know. After he got there, I'm sure some of his beliefs may have you know, pawned off on, on some of the other Indians, but I don't know. He was then taken to London. So he's, this is Squanto. Now he's taken to Spain. He learned the Christian faith. Prior to that, England learned English. Now he's taken to London, where he joined with a merchant and left for New England. This occurred in 1619. Where did he land? Plymouth. So again, what are the chances of an American Indian speaking English and understanding the Christian faith in 1619? Not very good. Not very good at all. Any chance God was working to ensure that the pilgrims would be successful upon their arrival in the new world? Again, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. It's just a question that I ask. The other thing about Squanto, he was from a pretty vicious tribe. The tribe of Indians that he belonged to were very territorial. You did not want to come across the territory of his tribe. Those that did were typically killed. They were typically killed. Here's the other interesting thing. Squanto and his tribe were located in Plymouth. We know that's where the pilgrims eventually landed. However, prior to the return of Squanto, and eventually the pilgrims, Squanto's entire tribe was killed by a plague. The entire tribe was killed by a plague. This would allow the pilgrims to land safely. To me, it's a pretty amazing chain of events. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. Did God have a hand in guiding the pilgrims to safety in the new world? Again, we don't necessarily know from the Bible. We may not know the answer to the question for sure until we can ask God himself in the kingdom. I'm going to ask that. That's going to be interesting to me. And again, this isn't anything I made up. I got these from various articles on the church's website, various articles that have been in the Good News magazine over the years. Just something that kind of sparked my interest. A lot of times we'll say, boy, that's a coincidence. But is it? What is it? That's when we think it might be. That's that time when you stop and say, thank you, God. We had a hawk. I don't know if hawks can talk, but if hawks can talk, that hawk today probably should have stopped and said, thank you, God. We were driving up the street, and this hawk was carrying another, I don't know if it looked like a bird to me, and it was coming right at our car. I looked up, and of course it startles you as you're driving. It's coming right at the window of the car, the side of the window. And all of a sudden, he dropped the bird, and he flew up and over and landed on the other side. Thank you, God. Obviously, hawks don't talk and probably aren't praising God. We know that, but that would be one of those things. If we ever had those things where we pulled out in front of a car and they stopped, I've had that happen a couple times, not paying attention. Do we immediately say, thank you, God? We should. Probably wasn't a coincidence that that car stopped. Johnny, prior to getting into the ambulance, pain immediately stopped. Probably not a coincidence. Pain doesn't just stop like that. We ask God to heal him. He did. I can guarantee you, Papa Johnny, immediately stopped and thanked God. I can guarantee you that. So again, don't know if we can answer the question whether or not God's hand was involved with that. Not sure. But the pilgrims certainly felt that way. They did thank God for them getting there safely, providing them with the bounty that, that God had provided. In Exodus 23, 27, it kind of goes back to that story. And again, the pilgrims would have known this scripture because they were students of the Bible. Exodus 23, 27 
It says, I will send my fear before you and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come. And I will make all of your enemies turn their backs unto me. Again, the, that tribe of Squanta, they were pretty vicious. Chances are they would have killed the pilgrims. What did God say? He's going to destroy all the people that come before him. Pilgrims would have known that. They knew that their safe arrival was the hand of God. They, they believed that. Now, whether it was or not, we don't necessarily know, but the pilgrims definitely believed that. The first winter we know was pretty devastating. Lost a lot of lives. Lost a lot of lives that first, first winter. I don't know that the pilgrims knew what they were getting into with the winter when they moved over here. We know that if it wasn't for Squanto and his instructions on how to survive, the pilgrims may not have made it. They may not have made it. Again, we don't know. There may have been a few strong that, that would have, but certainly Squanto's assistance helped in that endeavor. We know that Squanto taught the pilgrims in their own language how to farm. What a benefit. We have Armin Schultz. Some of you may know our German friend from Germany. Not sure if he was teaching me how to farm in German, I'd get a whole lot out of it. He tells stories kind of back and forth between German and English, and Anita Strange helps out with translation. I'm getting now, he's been here so many years, I, I can pick up on it, what he's saying now, but I'm not sure that first winter, if I was taught in German how to, how to survive, I would have made it. I wouldn't know what he was saying. Squanto spoke English. Some would say the most important thing that they learned was how to grow corn. Don't know if that's true, but that's what the history books say. And we know that he taught them to put that dead fish in the hole with the corn seed, and the corn was abundant. So although Squanto taught them the trick of planting, they would still rely on God to bring the rains. It's another interesting point, looking back. See, they experienced a pretty bad drought. Squanto taught them how to plant, had the fish, had the corn seed, everything was great, with the exception of water. Seeds don't grow without water. We know that, right? The pilgrims called for a day of fasting. They called for a day of prayer, and soon the rains fell. And the near-dead corn, as it's recorded, was revived. Amos 4, 7. Amos 4, 7. We know that God, obviously, is the one who controls the rains. In Amos 4, 7, he tells us that. He said, I also withheld rain from you, when the harvest was still three months away, I sent rain on one town, but would help, withheld it from another. One field had rain, another field had none, and dried up. So the pilgrims knew that God was the one in control of the rain. So what did they do? The rain wasn't coming, the corn was dying, we're in danger of starving again. We need to do something. We need to pray to God, and we need to fast so that our mind is right, so that when that prayer goes out to God, it's, it's with the right attitude. The pilgrims knew that God controlled the rain. Now, some of the commentaries on the pilgrims discuss the amazement that the Indians had when the rain came. Some of the commentaries will say that the Indians would also pray to their gods, not the God, not our God, not God the Father, their gods. The Indians had many different gods and worshiped many different, many different things, a lot of it related to nature. But the commentary said that when the Indians would pray to their gods, the rain had come. But it would be a driving rain, and it would destroy the crops. They said, when you pray to your God, he sends a gentle rain on the fields that is good for the crops. So according to the commentaries, the, the Indians could see the difference between what they got and what the pilgrims got because of some of the prayers that they sent up to God. See, the pilgrims knew that God had answered their prayers and provided for them. He knew that he definitely had a hand in them getting to the new world, that when they got there, they would be safe, that they would survive that first year. He knew, the pilgrims knew that God had intervened in their lives. Historians believe that the day of Thanksgiving, that the pilgrims celebrated, it may have had some roots in the Feast of Tabernacles. There's an area that I'd like to do a little bit more research on. But they say that there may be some roots to the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, they did have that Jewish influence when they were in Holland. We know that the pilgrims studied the Bible. William Bradford definitely studied the Bible. He studied the Hebrew Scriptures, Old and New Testament. We know that the pilgrims took them very seriously. The Scriptures, 
We know that they felt that they were kind of a promised people that were brought out of that spiritual is, or Egypt, Holland, England, and then off to the, to the New World. David Stearns, he uh, wrote a Bible commentary. He says this about the Feast of Tabernacles. He said, The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates the harvest coming in in a time of thanksgiving. The Puritans, who took the Old Testament very seriously, than, more seriously than most Christians, modeled the American holiday of Thanksgiving after Sukkot, or the feast. Why are you laughing? <laughs> so there is some indication that the pilgrims may have modeled their day of Thanksgiving after the feast. Obviously, they didn't hold it the same way that we do, but again, some indication there. And again, that would have been based on the, the scriptures that they knew and understand from the Bible. So, brother, as we look at our day of national Thanksgiving, we need to remember to whom we owe our thanks. God has blessed each of us differently, but he has blessed us. Just as the pilgrims' ancestors recognized God on their day of Thanksgiving, we too need to recognize God on our day of Thanksgiving. In Matthew 14, verse 19, as we begin to wrap up, Matthew 14, verse 19, it says, And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. What do we learn from this scripture? Do we just sit down, break the bread, eat the fish and call it good? No. Made it very clear. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. Who is he giving thanks to? He's giving thanks to God. So before we eat on Thanksgiving, will we ask God's blessing upon the meal and thank God for the meal? He sat down, he looked up the heavens, and he gave thanks. Many people will not do that. Joshua 9.14. These are the other people. Joshua 9.14, it says, The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. In other words, they didn't thank God for what they were given. That's those nine, the nine lepers that didn't come back. We're the one that come back and give thanks. We will give thanks. So, brethren, let us give thanks to God, for it is through him that we have all things. I'd like to conclude with one final scripture in the book of Psalms. Mr. Bell went to the book of Psalms during the sermonette. I'm going to end in the book of Psalms during the sermon. Psalm 100. Psalm 100, verse 4. Psalm 100, verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name.